One of the things you should try to achieve in this show is to, you know, you talk about one of your episodes being the natural history of trees. Well, start with like a redwood seed. You know, it's just like a fingernail clipping. And that that has all the information needed in it to create a 350-foot tree that's been standing there and interacting with this environment, responding to this environment for 2,000 years. It's all contained in this one thing. And there's, there's tremendous beauty in that process I and mean, how these trees do what they do. And they have a lot more to teach us, but people haven't been listening very much. Redwood is, uh, well, it's an oddball. It's a conifer. It is in the cypress family, Cupressaceae. It has um, very small cones, and it doesn't produce that many cones or seeds. And it, but yet it, it uh, prolifically sprouts from roots, from trunks. It's got this incredible capacity for sprouting or reiteration. It's got not only that capacity, but it has a huge capacity for longevity because it has rot resistance from the heartwood that resist fungal decay. It's got thick bark to resist fire. It's incredibly shade tolerant. So it can kind of hang out in the shade, and then when opportunity comes, it'll send up another one. It's the ultimate tree in a lot of ways. It combines a bunch of characteristics. And of course, it's the world's tallest tree, and probably one of the longest lived. We haven't been able to verify ages beyond about 2,000 years, but I wouldn't be surprised if in the near future we were finding trees considerably older than that. Yeah. But redwood is an oddball because every cell in a redwood has six sets of chromosomes which is very strange. It's called a hexaploid. So every gene in the redwood genome is represented by up to six different forms in every cell. Whereas humans, we have two, one from each parent. They've got six. It implies a tremendous reservoir of genetic diversity. It's also just, it's the only hexaploid conifer known. It's been on this earth for quite a while, but it goes back tens of millions of years, at least. Well, they don't have a tap root. They're very shallowly rooted. Um, they have you know, big pancake of roots. But the interesting thing is that they, all the trees are kind of, the roots interlock. And I suspect that they all share resources. So one tree can subsidize another. And in fact, occasionally you'll find in the forest an albino tree, pure white foliage. There's no photosynthesis possible. And it's still alive and growing. And I think it's just basically parasitic on this massive root network and they're all alive. And you know that they're not maintaining enough carbon from their own photosynthesis to survive. They're sucking off the, the mother root system. So they have a lot of really quirky characteristics. One thing that's interesting is that the, the wood production rates of the trees, at least here in the north coast of California, seem to have increased in the 20th century by quite a large margin. So if you plot, if this is time, and this is wood production. You get to about 1950, and it starts going like this. And it's going up a lot. Uh, and what's been happening since the 1950s? Well, if you look at the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere, after the Second World War, there's an inflection point where the CO2 level is starting to really go up. So it's tempting to link the increased wood production in the, in the northern redwoods with increased availability of the substrate for photosynthesis, CO2. It's certainly a growth surge unlike anything these trees have experienced in the last thousand years. There's more wood being produced by these trees now than at any time in the last thousand years or so. At least. That's as far back as our records go. But they're individuals, just like us. And they have these long lifespans, way beyond us. And the things that they can achieve in their lifetimes in terms of providing habitat for other creatures are just becoming impressive spectacles. When I've climbed these big old trees in the old growth forest, and I've climbed, you know, Washington, Oregon, California, Australia, primarily. But when you climb these, it doesn't matter where it is, in the big old trees, each one of them is an individual. Each one of them is, is distinctive. When you get into the old forest and you see these big old trees, and you, each one of them is so different from the other, and the way they move in the wind, and who's growing on them, and the views from the tops, how they look from each other's tops. And when you what I've found is that when you get into these situations where you're, 
your life's at stake because you're way the hell above the ground. You know, and you've got to focus on not killing yourself. When you are in that focused state, you can fi finally your your sense of self is gone, and you're just there. You know, these these moments they come unbidden, but they are they're they're very profound because you finally feel like you're connected, and you're not so focused on all your little stuff that you're worried about, all your little deadlines and things. And then you get a, you get a you can get a glimpse of what it must be like to be a tree. And to have that, that temporal scale. And that's what's so impressive about them. It's just how they can be in one spot for a thousand years. 